five minutes to go. Seventeen yachts from seven nations are setting out on the world's longest ocean race. Seven months and 27,000 miles of hard sailing. Burton Cutter, the largest yacht, just makes the start. Amazingly, there's no major collision as the yachts navigate through the vast armada of small spectator craft. Penduick 6, hot favourite of the experts. Built with massive French government support, she's pioneering a roofless new type of aluminium ocean racer with incredible strength and a keel made of the precious metal uranium. Eric Cavalli, the greatest name in French yachting, takes the tiller himself with so much at stake, calmly concentrating on catching up Great Britain too. Great Britain 2, Che Blythe's superb new yacht, built of fiberglass foam sandwich, is the scratch boat, setting an enormous Genoa that needs a keen lookout stationed in the bows. Bembridge Ledge Boy, the only mark to round on the course to Cape Town. Che's paratrooper crew have difficulty in laying the boy, and the cross current carries GB2 backwards in irons. This allows Penduick 6 to sail clearly into the lead, leaving GB2 to cope with the ebbing tide. The struggle to round the boy costs her a frustrating 20 minutes. An abandoned dinghy joins the flotilla accompanying the yachts out to sea. Tabali, now well ahead, is the first to risk a spinnaker in the freer wind. Despite the efforts made to compete Penduick 6 on time, she's had only one proving race and the weakness of her deck-stepped mast remains undetected. Two and a half weeks later, her mainmast will dislodge and snap in heavy seas and Tabali will put into Rio for a special replacement flown out from France. Spinnakers now set, the fleet gradually separate. Sayula is just ahead of Second Life and has Burton Cutter on her starboard quarter. Sayula is the most international boat in the race, built in Finland to an American design and skippered by her Mexican owner Ramon Carli with a mixed crew from seven countries. Adventure is the Royal Navy's official entry and the most proven boat in the race. Four different crews, one for each leg, have been training and tuning the boat all winter to Biscay and the Fastnet. They're the professionals. Second Life has an amateur crew so keen to race round the world, some have given up the security of their jobs and others let their houses to charter the catch. Trantois Expo is skippered by Jean-Pierre Millet and Dominique Guillet with typical French joie de vivre. Jacaranda, the only Admiral's Cup boat, is returning home to Cape Town. Her navigator, Mrs. Yvonne van der Beyl, whose son is first mate aboard Adventure, kindly brings in the washing to make a prettier picture. Jacaranda's sloop rig is in marked contrast to all the two-masted yachts. Another sloop is the Italian Guia, one of the few wooden yachts. At 45 feet, she and Copernicus are the two smallest boats in the fleet. This helps Guia, after a good start, to manoeuvre more easily through the spectator craft. But the French Criter, with her longer waterline and all her light weather sails and staysails set, 
moves steadily ahead, overhauling Guia to Leward. Krita can even set headsails on her mizzen. She carries the most highly experienced crew of racing yachtsmen in the fleet, but so much talent is to lead to trouble. The problem will be finally resolved by making crew changes at Sydney. Krita has now passed Guia, and Grand Louis is ahead of another Italian boat, Taranga. Grand Louis, an elegant French fiberglass schooner, is skippered by her owner, André Villon, and crewed mainly by relatives. His daughter, Sylvie, at the helm, is one of the seven girls taking part in the race. The Ketch CS and RB is the third Italian yacht. She has a very experienced skipper, but small crew. Otago, owned by a Polish yacht club, is a steel ketch with a narrow beam and low freeboard, her bow wave matching her elegant shear line. British soldier, formerly British Steel, of Che Blythe's solo circumnavigation, and now on charter to the army after considerable modification to accommodate a full crew. The grand old lady of the fleet, Peter von Danzig, built in Germany in 1936, and showing her age with low freeboard, tilted spinnaker pole, and old-style fittings. With the last of the spectators left over the horizon, the crew can fit into the ship's routine and concentrate on the 7,000 miles to Cape Town. Coastal pilotage gives way to deep-sea navigation, and each yacht will always have someone exposed to the weather at the helm. Burning. The crews live very close to nature in all her moods idling in the doldrums or creaming along with a foaming wake. Ocean sailing is not a series of traumatic dramas, rather a way of life with resourceful people able to cope with problems as they arise. In the tiny world of the boat, one has to learn to tolerate one's shipmates, confined in such cramped quarters for long periods. Voyaging under sail is one of the most deeply satisfying experiences in life. Admiring the effect of sunlight on translucent terraline, watching the spinnaker lifting to the gusts, yet keeping it filled and pulling all the time to drive the yacht along at its best speed, or wondering whether the wind has altered enough to change the headsail. Sails are among the most perfect things man has ever made. All the yachts are required to report their positions by radio each week. Sleep is not the only means of relaxation. If you play your cards right, you can escape from being on watch, and the bridge school has been known to start at 8 in the morning. Only the cry of all hands on deck can disturb the deck of cards below. De mes couilles seront les hauts bancs. Oh 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 oh, allons à Messine pêcher la sardine. Allons à l'Orient pêcher le hareng. Les poils de mes couilles seront les hauts bancs. Et les morfillons grimperont. At sea, time takes on a different dimension. It's surprising how soon you lose count of the days themselves, though navigation demands accuracy to the very second to work out a precise position with a sextant. The focal point of each 24 hours run is the noon to noon position and details are eagerly awaited by the crew. In the heat of the tropics, the sun cream goes on as the whiskers come off. Tropical squall ahead and sail changing takes precedence over everything else. 
to a racing crew, there's always the temptation to leave the spinnaker up as long as possible. In calm conditions, it's easy to gather in the billowing sailcloth, keeping it under control as the halyard is eased. But if it's left up too late in an approaching gale, it may be necessary to cut the guy. The bathtub slide easily on the slippery wet teak as the boys discover an exciting new game, dodgems on the afterdeck. As the dismasted Penduick 6 makes for Rio, Burton Cutter chooses the right side of the high and is the first to reach Cape Town, a day ahead of the Royal Navy and Adventure, who are delighted with their well-deserved first position on handicap. Making a landfall after 7,000 miles at sea is a wonderful moment, but Adventure sailors must now hand over to a new crew to give others their chance to share in the race. They have the added satisfaction of arriving in broad daylight, rather than groping their way carefully into a strange harbour in the middle of the night. The warmth of the welcome, the tremendous interest and hospitality of the local people are to become a delightful feature at each port of call. In dry dock, there's time for maintenance and a checkover before the roaring forties. But for the crew of the stilling complete Burton Cutter, time is running out. They take every chance to carry on building the interior. Find out why the winch is seized and live with the frustrations of the dockyard as they hammer out the headsail tack bolts. And hopefully seal the deck leaks. Time for farewells. and a calm start as the fleet heads out for the wild southern seas. Okay. Oh, that's it. Aboard Trente Trois Export, Dominique Guillet begins his last fateful voyage. Penduick 6, back in the race, goes the wrong side of a boy. Burton Cutter leads GB2, Trente Trois Export and Sayula whilst Penduick 6 returns to round the guard ship. Les Williams makes the best start, but the lightweight Great Britain 2 is slowly overhauling the fleet in the light airs. Jay's curry-fed crew of paratroopers have been carefully chosen for their compatibility and toughness. They're still learning to get the best from their beautiful boat, whereas their skipper has the unique experience of a westabout solo circumnavigation. Aboard the catch GB, the paratroopers and chain. All around the world they do sail A witching all day On the orders of Jay He's done it before but he went round the other way He's done it before but he went round the other way As they move south and east, the further they sail, the more the wind increases. Only four yachts catch the wind early and jump a hundred miles with little effort. And their crews begin to witness nature at her most magnificent and are awed by the strength of the roaring forties. It takes a cool head and enthusiasm to bring the stopped spinnaker back around the four stays before it breaks out accidentally.
home of a yacht is one of the few places where you can legally drink and drive. As the yachts battle onward, the seas take their toll. The incessant pounding is too much for Burton Cutter's 80-foot aluminium hull. Water seeps into her sail locker as welds fail and horizontal stringers break away from her bow plates, which are too thin to stand the five weeks battering run to Sydney. Reluctantly, the crew alter course for Port Elizabeth and repairs. The same Force 10 storm brings the first tragedy of the race. Paul Waterhouse is swept into the sea and lost from Taranga. Five days later, on Trente Trois Expo, co-skipper Dominique Guillet is lost overboard. The shattered crew make for Fremantle. Off South Australia, the prevailing westerly wind becomes erratic and the southerly busters come howling in. It's vital to know the yacht's exact position before entering the Bass Strait, graveyard of sailing ships and thousands of unfortunate sailors. Most of the yachts have sophisticated navigational aids and radio beacons on Cape Otway and Cape Farewell give them accurate bearings on their direction finding equipment to help them through the poor visibility, low-lying coasts and treacherous currents which make this the most dangerous passage of the whole race. Nowadays, we can all be better navigators than Magellan and Columbus, but how many lives could have been saved had the clipper ships had the benefit of these electronic aids? Penduick 6 has proved herself on the toughest leg of the race. Tabali has led all the way from Cape Town to take line honours at Sydney, with Sayula taking the handicap prize. But Penduick 6 is shortly to be dismasted for the second time, only 200 miles out of Sydney. Great Britain too has lost her mizzen and broken two spinnaker poles, and it's been a hard leg for adventure, with steering problems causing a drop in handicap position that will cost her the race. A delayed start gives a little more time to enjoy Sydney's welcome and get vital repairs carried out. Several yachts have suffered knockdowns and all have minor damage. Back in Port Elizabeth, Burton Cutter is careened. Her damaged bow sections are re-welded, but the repairs take longer than expected and she's forced to withdraw. now reduced to 14, are bound for Rio. The Australian summer soon gives way to the freezing cold of the deep southern ocean and the crew prepare for adventure. But on GB2, Bernie Hosking is lost south of New Zealand in icy seas. He'd already been rescued on the voyage to Cape Town, but this time his luck runs out. GB2's crew press on with renewed determination, taking a northerly course and are soon 500 miles clear of their nearest rivals heading for Cape Horn. Modern electronic instruments are a great help to a racing crew who constantly need to adjust their sails for maximum performance. They enable relatively inexperienced yachtsmen to achieve a standard of efficiency, particularly by night, that even practiced old sailors of the tea clipper days would find hard to match.
the army crews aboard the 59-foot Ketch British soldier provide a useful communication service, relaying radio messages from other craft. The yacht is taken over by an entirely new crew of nine at each port of call, and their enthusiastic team manager is skipper on the longest and most exciting third leg. Major Neil Carlier exercises his skill to bring the sun's image skimming across the horizon for an accurate observed position. Captain George Vallings, the most experienced navigator in the race, takes one of the most direct routes to Cape Horn. It brings adventure to nearly 60 degrees south, well within the ice line. For two and a half days, they sail in Arctic conditions amongst the icebergs. It's hard to use a sextant wearing gloves, but in these latitudes, dressing to go on watch takes the crew a good 20 minutes as they struggle into oilies over air crew bunny suits and Arctic underwear. For well over two weeks, they race in seas that are only four degrees above freezing. Some of the larger bergs are three quarters of a mile long and 300 feet high and from them pour a stream of small growlers, dangerous as a minefield in the short polar night. Some yachts experience actual icing on deck, and Guia was once prevented from reefing by a solidly frozen medsail. Ahead of them lies the southernmost tip of America, the legendary Cape Horn. A wild, isolated promontory of massive rock, jutting far out into the roaring forties, and deflecting their fury into some of the world's most treacherous seas. In these turbulent waters, the strength of the prevailing wind from astern demands constant vigilance from the helmsman to prevent the yacht from broaching in the heavy following swell. Each rolling wave lifts the boat bodily upwards and forwards, surging her along its length to let her sink again, wallowing in the succeeding trough. As the boats pass the horn, the weather lives up to its capricious reputation, treating the yachts to everything from light airs to a storm force 10. Now the fleet heads north, up the South American coast, making for Rio de Janeiro. Soon the leading boats are well into the warmer waters of the South Atlantic, and the crews feel welcome relief from the tension of sailing in the exhausting Southern Ocean, while the smaller and slower craft continue the long, cold struggle. Great Britain, too, is the first to arrive to find sun-drenched Rio in carnival mood. Mexican Sayula at the start of the vital pursuit race back to England, looking as immaculate as the day she left Portsmouth. It's hard to believe she was rolled over to 150 degrees on the tough second leg, yet continued to make such a fast time, she's still overall handicap leader. The intricate needlework on her sail is the only visible sign of the vast distances she's travelled. Rita's transom has a new aluminium extension to give her more lift. Adventure is challenging strongly and will soon gain her third victory in four legs. 
The big fiberglass catch, Second Life, like Adventure and Sayula, is a production boat, giving a consistent performance. Although her crew never make the prize list, they can now celebrate joining the modest band of yachtsmen who rounded the horn under sail. Skipper Roddy Ainsley must feel well pleased with the boat's trouble-free voyage. Burton Cutter is now back in the race after her disappointing withdrawal from the southern legs, but with the consolation of having proved her speed with the fastest ever passage from Cape Town. In her private race home with GB2, the fortunes of the first leg are reversed. This time, Burton Cutter goes around the non-existent Azores High and is beaten by GB2, taking a direct route. A stitch in time saves nine is certainly true of sail repairs. On a long voyage, the sails suffer the strain of constant use for weeks on end and the stitching wears out. There are sewing machines on board to cope with more serious damage, but it's difficult to spread out the vast areas of wet sail cloth in the confined space of the cabin to replace a complete panel. When a really large Genoa or Spinnaker blows out, it can take two days to repair. Sunset at sea brings the tranquility of the wide open spaces and the full glory of the evening sky. Sadly, all voyages must come to an end. As familiar landmarks appear, regret that the long adventure is nearly over gives way to joy at anticipated reunions. Great Britain, too, finishes with a spinnaker flying flourish to take line honours and the Duke of Edinburgh's award for active service personnel. But it's Mexican Sayula who sails in the worthy winner of the Whitbread Trophy for the fastest voyage round the world on corrected time. She comes back to a tumultuous bank holiday welcome. The Whitbread Trophy is presented by Prince Philip at the Mansion House. Ramon Carlin of Sayula and his international crew celebrate winning a race that made history, bringing together yachtsmen from 15 nations in an unforgettable and unique adventure.